hey, this is Christmas. We're supposed to be carols and get out of here. You're having real church. You betcha. You betcha we are. I want you to look to the screen and look at a Bible verse with me. 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 8, the scripture says, Above all things, have fervent love for one another, for love will cover a multitude of sins. How's your love doing? Is it fervent? White hot? Is it a love that consumes everything that isn't love? See, it's a time of year where we get together, and a large part, we start to see some people we don't see all the time. It's that time of year where part of us goes, yeah, we're going to see them, aren't we? Yeah, the one who still owes me money. We're going to see that one, the one that's been talking, the one that's been causing strife and division in the family, the one that's just broken my heart over and over. But it's okay. We're going to love. We're going to love them. And and we do our best when we get together with people because some people we just like more than others, right? I mean, right? We do. I love you. I just don't like you. We'll pull that card sometimes. But we, we, we muster, manifest this thing up that we call love at this time of the year with some people that we would just rather not be around. But, but it's, it's the season, man. Come on. Get the eggnog out. If I can put a little vodka in it, I'm good. And, and I can give all the love you want. And, and, and that really happens a lot. That's why a lot of times drinking increases around the holidays as well as depression. Because all the stuff that we carry inside, we just stuff it down and we cover it over with materialism and gifts and drinking and falsehoods. Oh, it's so good to see. Did you see what they were wearing? Oh, my gosh. It looks ridiculous. It's, it's like, a, like a high school movie or something we're watching that's really going on behind the scenes. Now, you're going, Dave, this is kind of in my face for a Christmas message. Well, you're at Reveal Fellowship. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Uh, yeah, well, but I, I, I'm thinking about this because I look at this verse and I go, wow, Peter, who this dude loved God. I mean, he wasn't one of these religious hypocrites you watch on TV. Let me tell you what, if, if Peter was in a grave, he'd be rolling over in it, knowing what's going on just on television in the name of Jesus. And what goes on in churches, it looks more like a time of a Broadway show than this time of worship to God, right? But, but this guy who is so sold out to God, he, he says, above what? All things? That's noteworthy. Above all things, not just have a love, have a fervent, white hot love for one another because love has it covered, man. Has it covered. See, God, who the Bible says is love, who is God? God is love. That's how he wants to be defined to his creation. More than anything else, he wants to be known that he is love. And love is synonymous with forgiveness. I mean, if God wasn't forgiving, he'd had no one to talk to at all. Right? He, he, love is really, it's, it's forgiving, not, not conditional forgiving. It's, it's a Agape, it's kind of like when God died for you on a cross, you and I, we were like everyone else, spitting in his face, piercing his side, doing everything we could do in the name of Yahweh, and he says, I love you, and I'm going to die for you. Not, well, you need to own your sin, and then I'll do something for you, then I'll forgive you. That's not love. That's not love at all. And, And what we see happen in our families many times is a window into our soul of where we're really at in this thing that we call faith. I mean, who doesn't want love, right? I mean, we grow up, I love you, Daddy, I love you, Mommy, and then after a while, that's not enough, and then we diss our dad and our diss our mom, and then we try and find a boyfriend or girlfriend or somebody to tell us that we're wonderful and we're all that, and, oh, I love you because you make me feel good about me until you don't, and then you're a jerk. Well, that wasn't love, <laughs> you know? And then, oh, I love this new boat. I love pizza. I love... What's love have to do with Remember that song came out so many years ago? So much confusion about what love is, and, and all along, the creator of everything, including love says, look at me. Look at me. I'm I'm here to show you and display you and 
offer to you what this is. And you can only have fervent love for one another after you've seen and experienced God's fervent love for you. Otherwise, it's just phony, which is what we see in our houses many times this time of the year. Boy, we're getting called out today, huh? What is love? I like what the Apostle Paul, inspired by the Holy Spirit, says, love is patient and kind. I mean, this is always fun. I always like to take this verse, this passage, and kind of put my name in there and go, does this fit today? That Dave is patient and kind. Where's my wife? Let me ask her. Dave is patient and kind, and Dave is not jealous or boastful or proud or rude. Epic failure. Wow. Bummer. This is a downer on Christmas. Love does not demand its own way. Nope, not good. It's not irritable unless it has a Snickers bar. There you go, right? It keeps no record of wrongdoing. Of being, uh, we know we failed that one, right? I mean, if there's anything in counseling sessions I get more from people, it's always the husband going, she keeps bringing up the past, man. She keeps bringing up the same stuff. I mean, she needs to like learn to be a Christian and be forgiving because you He's basically saying that love is a license to do whatever I want to do. And, and it, you see it, it's just crazy. And for better or for worse, oh, my gosh. We just don't know what love is. And it's blatantly in our face, you know. It's kind of like we have symptoms of disease and sickness and bacterial infections and viral infections. And all these symptoms come out. And the symptoms are only telling us about something on the inside. All this stuff that we read about, like jealousy, Pride, injustice, all this stuff that we look at is just a, a sign of a sickness, of a love deficit. And it's an epidemic in the church, for real, it really is. Because what we call love compared to the love at Calvary is a cruel hatred. And there's something that doesn't add up with me because I, I'm thinking about how many people in our country say they believe in God. I saw this recently on a Gallup poll. It says 89% of Americans say they believe in God, and 78% of Americans believe they're going to heaven. Now, if I line up, the, which means the majority of our country believes in God, and, and to me, believes meaning kind of like the Amplified Bible, it says to believe is to cling to, trust and rely on, adhere to. That means what it means to believe in God. And so if you believe, love becomes a reflex. Are you with me? It just becomes this reflex where it's just like, it ain't you. It's God in you because you're not capable of that. You, you can muster it up and fake it really good and act until the last straw comes and then we see the real deal, right? But only God can love like that. And if we see the large percentage of just, I'm just like in the world, just our country, go, I believe in God, I'm believing going to heaven. But there's so much hatred and selfishness and self-righteousness and judgment and all this. Then I got to go, how can I say I believe in God and I don't love? And we're created to love and be loved. How awesome is that? God, you, you made me not to put me on an assembly line or put me in some type of, you know, some, uh, marketing thing and, and, and somehow earn something with me or, or use me. You, you wanted me as in a relationship with you, and you created for that, and we're all searching for that. You, you ever, like, on your computer, and, and your network's not working right, and you just see that little Apple icon just moving and spinning, whatever? It's so annoying, Right, and you just paid for the upgrade on top of it, and that was just the last straw. And, and it's, that's what we're kind of like in looking for love, because we've tried so many things and people and places and careers and new cars and oh my gosh, politicians. Try that one on for size. All the stuff and nothing, nothing satisfies. Aren't you so glad that God love is so patient for us to say, "I'll try you last." Because that's what we do. We try God last. After we've just went belly up, broke, bankrupt, got a couple abortions behind us, lots of shame from sexual immorality, all kinds of anger and loneliness because of all the broken relationships and gossip and slander and abandonment wounds and all this stuff. I mean, we're just a mess. And God says, I'll take you because I love you. I love you. 
Who else is like that? I don't, I don't know anybody like that. But th the love that comes in the room like a light in a dark room, it has to come at the right time. You ever wondered why some of you who are saved, you heard the gospel so many times and had people love on you, pray for you, witness, but it went on for years, and then one day, boom, it was just like a revelation, a light came on, and you're going, how did I not get this before? All this time I wasted doing my thing instead of your thing, me thinking it's my way when you are the way, God, how did, his perfect time right? And when God sent his son, I want you to know, when he came 2,000 years ago, it wasn't just by random chance of a lottery in heaven. You know what? Today's the day. It was the perfect time. Galatians chapter 4, listen to this verse and let it rock your soul. Listen to this. Oh. Chapter 4, verse 4, but when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law to redeem those who were under the law, that we might receive adoption as sons. At the fullness of time, God had been counting down the microseconds. There's going to be a perfect time where I'm going to come, and I'm going to send my son who's under this heavy burden of having to achieve, of having to somehow earn acceptance, earn access. It's this system is just weighty. It's heavy. It's oppressive. It's called the law. God gave it to show you you couldn't do it without him. Because we're so prideful. We're no different than Lucifer who tried to raise himself up in heaven. No different than Adam and Eve that thought, I'll do it my way. We're no different. Made of the same stuff, you know. God's working the virus out. And trying to earn your way in the good grace of God is surely a way to work out the virus. Because you just get really discouraged trying to be a good girl and a good boy. I mean, that's what we're taught, right? Be a good girl, be a good boy. Santa Claus will come to you. You don't want to be on the naughty list. You know, everyone's on the naughty list. Everybody, you were born on the naughty list. You were born in sin, deserving hell. Well, thanks, Pastor Dave. That's encouraging on a Christmas. <laughs> but it's the truth. It's the truth. I mean, to think any different is a sign of deception. The Apostle Paul says, hey, it's a trustworthy saying that Jesus Christ came to save sinners for whom which I am the worst. Apostle Paul thought he was the worst. Oh, my gosh, I need a reality check, Right? But what happens is when you start to see it like that, you go, wow, God, you came to show me that I couldn't do it without you. And there was this heavy system of earning my way towards redemption and paying the price of my transgression that you only you could do. And you came to show me what love looks like so you could erase my debt. You ever been in debt before? Probably no one in here is in debt, right? We're all debt free? All debt free? I mean, how cool would that be if, if Bill Gates walked in the room and says, I'm here, Merry Christmas, I'm making everyone debt-free here. Hallelujah! Praise the Lord! <laughs> We'd be going crazy, right? That'd be awesome. And yet, the creator of all the universe says, I want to wipe away your debt. I want to make you debt-free. And we go, that's nice. <laughs> That's a head scratcher. How can we not fall over from that? You know, we see people win lottery. Or remember the day Ed McMahon used to visit someone's house? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Some of you millennials, who's Ed McMahon? <laughs> yeah, but but you know, he was a guy with a lot of money, I guess. But he, would, you won, and people would faint. They would fall down. <laughs> you know, they would just freak out. The creator of all the universe says, I want to make you debt free. I don't want anything to be held against you, no matter what you've done. I want, I want to, my love to cover it. I want my love to wash it away. That blows my mind. What do you say to that? And why is it some people are humbled and broken by that, and other ones in their entrepreneur spirit and self-righteousness go, 
Would you please finish? I'm here for my wife, and I want to get back to the eggnog with the vodka, please. And, and some are like that. It, why, why is someone like that and someone just right now feeling the anointing in the room and just going, I'm even saved, and I'm broken listening to this? Because it has to be just the right time. God sent forth his son, born of a virgin, under the law to redeem those under the law. Because he wanted children who had been stolen and kidnapped to be restored to him. And so he picked the perfect time. And he sent his son at a time where Israel and Rome and that culture had intertwined this perfect time, it was the perfect time spiritually. See, Israel for 400 years had not heard the voice of God. God is a big fan of giving you what you want, and that's a double-edged sword, that spiritual truth. And he says, you don't want to hear my voice for 400 years, no prophetic words, no king to reign. The previous 200 years before Christ came, Rome had just been dominating the world, and, 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 and they had this polytheistic society of all kinds of false gods, which was nothing new for Israel in the land of Moab and all the polygamous nature. So this is a whole nation's history, but now it's like the very epitome of it with Rome. So here you've got Israel, a monotheistic society. We believe in there is one God, and then you've got Rome, but yet they're yoked together. And there was like a fever pitch going on at this time because you had this, this real heart of what spirituality was in faith in one God creator. But yet there's this promise of Messiah of deliverance that for centuries has not been happening and God's not even speaking. So there's a hunger. Let me tell you what, before you can ever hear God say, I want to wipe your dead out, my love cover your sin, you've got to go through years of silence and darkness and desperation. So if you're here today and everything's going wonderful, why would you need God? You have fallen under the delusion that you can do it without him. You never thought about going broke or losing your job or having your spouse cheat on you or whatever terrible cataclysmic thing goes on. You never thought about those things as a blessing. But if it's a thing that humbles you, God will do what he has to do. It's not that he wanted the Babylonians to carry away Judah. It's not that he wanted the Assyrians to carry away the ten northern tribes. It's just because they were his kids that were kidnapped, and they were duped and deceived to think they could do it on their own. So he says, you need a reality check. Dad, you, you enjoy spanking your kids? Do you remember? Like, lighten them up, and man, that was fun. No, of course not. Remember? Remember, remember your dad saying to you, oh, this will hurt you more than it'll hurt me. What? I, but it's true. It hurts God's heart to discipline us, but he loves us so much. He says, Israel, I'm going to have your enemies overtake you. And all of a sudden, spiritually, they're desperate. They're discouraged. Man, it was the perfect time for God to come because they had had some spark of humility. But it wasn't only the right time spiritually, it was the right time politically because, because of what taken place with Rome. I mean, think about this. Since the Tower of Babel, the whole world had not spoken one language until then. What language was that? Greek, yes. The Greek language, everybody spoke Greek. So he's going to come as Messiah at a time where ever, I mean, the name Jesus is the Greek word for the Hebrew word Yehoshua or Joshua. Like the name of Jesus, Greek word. God came at a time. Do you know that before Jesus came, the word agape in Greek didn't even exist. It was like lots of new things were happening here. And, and, and the economy had been amazing for 200 years, pretty much hardly any wars to speak of. Rome had actually built 250,000 miles of road, 50,000 of which are paved, and many you can still see today. I mean, civilization had come a long way. So if you ever wonder, like, why didn't God come when we had jets? Because he could have had his own plane. Isn't that the sign of a successful pastor? No, it's not. He came at a time where it was the perfect time because that's what happens. But it's not only spiritually, it's not only politically that was right. It's personally. God's going to come into your life and speak to you at a time where you're acknowledging there's an emptiness that only he can fill. 
And we see this manifest in the prophetic promise of one of the signs of his coming. A prophet known as the Prince of Prophets, he's more quoted than the other prophet in the Bible, is the prophet Isaiah. It says in chapter 7 that the Lord himself will give you a sign. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and he will call him Emmanuel, God with us. Isaiah said a time is going to come where there's going to be an empty womb, and no one else can fill that but me. It's never been done before. It'll never happen again. But he says, this is going to be a sign. And when God does something, we we usually have a tendency to look at the surface and it goes much deeper. We know in part, we prophesy in part, as the Bible says, but we'll we'll know fully when we get to heaven. But I'm enjoying the glory walk of learning more and more spiritual truth, aren't you? It just increases my faith. And this whole thing with the virgin birth, for me, God's kind of up the ante, kind of turn the knob up a little bit of just how deep that is. That he says, the perfect time is for me to come and fill something that's empty that only I can do. You know, I heard not too long ago, it was actually it was a while ago, but it was it was Will Smith. He was talking about Christianity and, and mocking the virgin birth. And let and, and me tell you, there's reasons like certain heretics, some of you students of the Bible have heard of guys like Rob Bell, different people, they come along claiming to be Christians, but they mock things like this, the virgin birth. Beware, because this is really important that we understand. This is a supernatural, what do you call it? A sign. I was reading online recently that some agnostics and atheists were, were basically saying, we don't believe in God, but even if it was a virgin birth, that's completely possible because it's something that biolog- uh, biologists called um, parthogenesis. It's, it's a biological scientific term that means that someone's able to give birth without consummating, without fertilization. And, and they were trying to attack the virgin birth by saying it's like certain animals, like the kimono uh, dragon, a lizard, asexual. It can actually give birth to other, others' kind without their eggs being fertilized. Certain insects. It's in virtually a virgin birth, right? And so, so these atheists come and say, so we don't, it's, it's a normal thing. We don't need God for that. It creates, well, number, a couple of things. And this is what really rocked my world today. I, I start researching this and I go, that's true. There are certain animals, never a human, but there's animals that are asexual that can actually have that type of activity happen. But anytime one of these insects are animals, actually have some type of life outside of fertilization, it's always of its kind. In other words, if you have a dragon or an insect that actually produces life without the eggs being fertilized, it will always be female. Every time. You'll never have a female produce a male outside of fertilization. Ever. Now, I think it's fascinating to go, God says, I'm going to bring Parthenesis, I, what I'm going to do, I'm going to bring a birth, and it's not going to be a female, Mary. It's going to be a male. Because I'm coming to produce sons, to produce of my kind, not your kind, of my kind. That's what the gospel is sent to do, to love covers sin, and it's meant to bring a life in you that produces that something is not of you. It's him. It's kind of like with love. We try to produce love, and, and it's, it's a mask. It's a facade. It's not real. And that's why you have so many people that walk down the aisle. I love you. I'll be with you the rest of my life. I love you. You're perfect. I'm calling a lawyer. Daddy, daddy, I love you. I hate you. Right? We don't know what love is. We need God, who is love, to come in an empty space in us that only he can fill and produce what love is. Only him. And until that happens, man, with that apple icon spinning, we're in search mode, being used and abused, being filled with shame and discouragement. But I got good news for you. God loves people who are one big hot mess. If you read Matthew chapter 1, how many of you, if you went to read the Bible, then I'm going to read through the New Testament. You look at Matthew, and you look at all these names, beget, 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 beget. I don't need to read that. And we skip over to the where Jesus, right? That's an amazing section, 
Because it's basically saying people like Abraham, who was a liar, Judah, who wanted to kill his brother, Rahab, who was a prostitute, Ruth was a Moabitess, oh yeah, and David, the murderer and adulterer who married Bathsheba, her name's in there too, the seductive, oh wait a minute, Jesus, that was the bloodline, you came through them, you went in them and moved through them? Oh, that's encouraging for a lot of us in this room, right? Come on, that's, that's incredible. God just loves to take piles of ashes and make something so beautiful. And he knows the perfect time to do it. Look with me at Matthew chapter 1, verse 18. It says, now the birth of Jesus Christ took place in this way. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. Now, understand, real, real quick, understand the setting. You've got Joseph, which we really don't know how old he is. Mary, somewhere put around 14, 15 years old. They're betrothed, meaning they're legally married. Many times they'd actually live with their in-laws while they were building their home, but they would not be together. There was no consummation of the marriage until a year after this betrothal began, and then there was a wedding feast celebration, and then they consummated what was already legal. And they're in this period of time right now, and one day this 15, 14-year-old girl finds out she's pregnant. Now, can you imagine the politics of that? Wow. Wow. It says her husband, Joseph, being a just man and unwilling to put her to shame, resolved to divorce her quietly. So here, Joseph, I mean, if, if I'm Joseph, my world has just been rocked. Because it wasn't like, you know what, I'm going to try you out, take you for a test drive. Let's live together. You know what, you're too much of a nag. Next. That, 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 no, that betrothal, man, that, it, and many times it was arranged marriages back then, like it still is in third world countries today. As a matter of fact, the divorce rate is much lower in those countries of arranged marriages than today where we're moved more by romance than commitment. That's another study. But you think about the culture, the atmosphere, where Joseph, this is a big deal. And let me tell you what, Joseph, he says he was a just man. He was not going to shame her. And you know what the culture, this is what they did. If you were a Mary back 2,000 years ago, and you cheated upon your legal husband, what would happen is you would be taken to the city square, the center of the town, and they'd put you in this big container of cow manure up to your knees and throw rocks at you until you fell down face first in it. That's what they would do. But Joseph, like, I, I mean, I can imagine my heart would be broke. I'd be like, Mary, I'd be crying my eyes out. I'd be, I'd be a mess. Like, how could you do this, Mary? Because it's obvious, you know, it's obvious he doesn't believe her because he's going to divorce her, right? So he's convinced that she's a liar as well as an adulteress. But he still loves her. Love covers sin, not exposes it. God didn't come to point the finger as some people you might know as Christians or some preachers to condemn you. No, he came only to point something out. There's a disease, and I'd like to heal it. I got a, the ability to remove your debt so you don't spend your life eternally in prison. I'd like to remove it. If you let me, I love you. I see a picture and foreshadow of such love by Joseph here. I, I think he gets the short end of the stick in this story many times, and we kind of brush over that, but I go, Joseph just man. But he's, he's troubled. Wouldn't you guys be troubled? You think? Maybe a little bit? <laughs> it says, but as he considered these things, behold. So he's, he's meditating. I, I can't marry a woman who's committed adultery and she's lying, uh, but I'm confused because I know Mary. This doesn't make any sense. So he's considering. Personally, I believe praying. God, I need your help with this. Right? 
You ever been in a situation where, man, this is a lose-lose situation. I marry an adulterous liar or I divorce and I'm, I'm staying in my whole culture, my whole town, and my nation for that matter. This is, there's no way out of this. What am I? God, help. And God talks at moments like that, family. He talks. <laughs> As he's considering these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream saying, Joseph, son of David. Do not fear to take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Joseph woke from sleep, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. He took his wife, but knew her not. They didn't consummate the marriage. They didn't have sex until she had given birth to a son and called his name Jesus. Wow. Wow. Now, you might say, see, it ended it happily ever after right there. No, they still had tough times. We read in John 2 at the wedding of Cana, many theologians believe the reason Mary wanted Jesus to turn the water into wine is, is proof that I wasn't a liar and that I didn't, you know, fornicate, and that you really are from God. Show up and waiting for 30 years. No doubt there are people who didn't believe her story. Her own husband didn't believe her. There were challenges. Man, when you accept Christ in you, I'll tell you what, you will face challenges. It drives me nuts. I know, it's a short trip, right? It drives me nuts when people invite other people and say, come, receive Christ as Savior Pray the prayer and have the emotional vomiting moment where you feel better about you and then get back on with your life and now you're saved and it's a license to be happy and do what you want to do. There's lots of people peddling that kind of gospel out there. It's not biblical. When Christ comes into you, let me tell you what, there is no one that will live a godly life in this age and not suffer persecution. You know, we spend a lot of time praying for people in China and different people, even Venezuela, that tsunami. Oh, my gosh, some of the stuff, right? Horrid. And, and, and our hearts break, as they should. But there's another side of that coin, which is those people are probably a lot closer to God than we are. I mean, I see pictures in, in different little ads and Internet and videos where churches are, are kicked out of their buildings and they're out in public parks or even hiding and they're praying and pouring out their soul to God versus we just kind of come and throw God a couple bones and Merry Christmas, Happy Birthday, Jesus. And we say we believe in God, we believe we're going to heaven, and, and we might very well be wrong. And it's not until God comes and rocks our world and deletes our computer and every calendar date we ever had, past, present, and future, and said, it's my plan now. And when that happens, let me tell you what, while the exterior outside of your life gets turned upside down and things don't look so good on the inside, you're going, Christ is in me. Emmanuel, God is living inside me. I mean, that's what happened with me when I was 18, right? I'd been going to church every Sunday, and I got go church on Sunday and stoned out of my mind on Monday. I thought it was okay. I mean, after all, God said, let there be grass. Come on, Lord, I can justify this. I mean, even today it's almost illegal, so it's, it's cool, right? It's okay to fornicate. I mean, a Dr. Ruth says if it feels good, it's okay. I mean, the world will just tell you all kinds of stuff just to lie to you, man. And take your eyes off the ultimate prize. A love relationship with a holy God. I mean, that's intense. God loves you enough to bankrupt heaven for you, to bring you to him. What do you say to that? What do you say to that, man? I'd rather have a career. I'd rather have a car that's going to break down. I'd rather have, it's just not, none of it's worth it. 
I had so many people. When I got back 18 years old, man, I got back from Alabama, gave my life to Jesus, and, and I'm hanging around with all my friends, friends that I love, friends that I cared about. I was just talking to my son about this today. You know, when I came back to South Florida, and I had all my party animal buddies, and, and they were friends, man. I can remember one guy walking through depression with this one guy when his parents got divorced, and we were, were friends. But I find after that Jesus came to live inside of me, it just wasn't the same. And, and they would pull a bottle of Jack Daniels out and pull out a, you know, a joint and, and, and watch things and say things and relationships that I just couldn't engage in. And, and so I would sit back separate from them, not really knowing any better. I didn't, have, I didn't have a church. I didn't have a church family. If you have one, you're blessed. You're very blessed. I didn't have that. I just had a religious thing on the corner that people called it a church, but looked more like a morgue or a freezer. And that's all I could see was either a freezer or a circus, but I didn't see anything that really represented like the head, Christ and his body acting in a way that looked like the Bible. I didn't see that. So I'm just trying to be the church, right? And, and, but I'm finding that as time goes by, people didn't want anything to do with me. My friends that loved me and said they loved me, that everything seemed fine face to face, but they wouldn't call me anymore because they didn't want anything to do with me. That hurt. Here I'm 52 and I can remember that from when I was 18. That hurt. But it was a test. If I hear you say you love me, if it's enough, then when others don't, I'll be okay. You know, you know. In other words, we need the test. The plant needs the sun to come out to tell, do you have any roots? Because if you don't, you're going to die. What looked like life wasn't really life. It's not that they lost their salvation. They never really were saved. It just looked that way, you see. Yeah, we all believe in God. We all believe we're going to heaven. It ain't true. It's a narrow road to the kingdom of heaven. Only a few find it, Jesus says. There are people in this room that you think that you're saved, but if you really read your Bible, you know your life doesn't line up with people who say they love God. And your excuse is the hypocrisy on TV. Oh, stop that. Stop with the excuses. It's just about you and Christ on the cross. It's about you in an empty tomb. It's about you in an eternity that you'll be with him or without him. And it's just about you and him. And tonight might be the time. <laughs> I mean, think about that. It might be the time to announce tonight that Christ is going to live in you. And I'm here telling you this story because if that's the case, I'm also telling you life is going to change. I won't lie to you and tell you Come forward, raise your hand, confess Jesus with your mouth, and you won't go to hell with all those that are rejecting the gospel because that's, that's the truth. You don't hear about that in church a lot today, that there is a hell. I'm, I'm telling you there is a hell. It's not a place you want to be. It's not a place that God wants you to be. He doesn't want anybody to be there. He created it for the devil and the angels, but all those that reject his love that can cover and make you debt-free, that's the only other place in eternity there is. I'm reading you a verse now that you've heard because or read because you've watched football games. <laughs> but there's more to it than what you read on the football games. Listen to this, family. Mind-blowing. God, creator of all the universe, the omnipotent, the omniscient, the all-powerful, all-present, Alpha and the Omega, him, that, that one. He so loved the world. He gave his only begotten son, that whoever would believe in and remember, cling to, trust in, rely on, adhere to, if you love me, he'll obey me because you love me. He who believes in Jesus should not perish but have everlasting life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved he who believes in him is not condemned. You're debt free. You're debt free. You're right before your God. Oh, but there's always a but. Either you're a saint or you're an ain't. There's no in between. Hot or cold. No different than you would want with your spouse. But he who has not believed, cling to, trust, and relied on Christ who has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son, has been condemned. You're already, you're lost. 
I would just ask tonight for you to consider really where you're at because here's the deal. There are some in this room that you think that you know God, but it, you, it's a God after your kind. It's a love after your kind. It's a spirituality after your kind, and it's not real. It, it's a facade. It's like those buildings in a Western that have the face, but there's nothing in back. It's like that. And God wants to make you whole because he loves you. He's jealous for you. He wants you to be willing to lay down everything for him. And I'm telling you, he's worth it. Jesus is worth it. Everyone told me, well, not every, but some people said, Dave, it's just religion. And there's a few that would, like, blow some smoke in my face. Come on, Dave, come on. I just couldn't because I was in love with someone who gave everything for me, you see. And that's the way I am with my wife. I've never cheated on my wife. I, I couldn't. I love her so much. I've given my whole life on this earth to be her husband. Well, I've given my heart to my Savior for eternity to be his bride forever. And here on this earth, let me tell you what, he gives a peace and a joy that no one or nothing can take from you. I know that if this ticker stopped right now, okay, I know that if a tsunami hit Florida or a nuclear bomb hit Florida or whatever happened, you know what? It's so great. I'm not worried about it. Bring it. Bring it. Because I want to go home. This is not my home. This isn't my government. This isn't really the potty I'm spending attorney in. Hallelujah. <laughs> you know, and I know this, right? It's like, would you know that? Christianity is in this burden. Oh, gosh, I got to be good. That's religion. Oh, I can't do that. That's religion. You know what I mean? It's like I would rather pray and sit there for two hours and talk with God and sing to him and hear his heart than watch my favorite movie. And, and that's because I have life in me. If, you don't have, if your Christianity is not like that, consider one. Either you're not saved and you just think you are because you've bought a false report on what Christianity is. Or you're just so backslidden that you've lost sight of your identity in Jesus. Either way, tonight's a night to get right with your holy God that you're going to see face to face. Don't wait. Don't, don't wait. Family, stand to your feet because we're going to pray. We're going to pray. We're going to do what our God loves the most, and that is when we talk to him and we open up our hearts and we open up our minds and we let go of things we're holding on to that he might put something better in our hands. If you would, bow your heads, close your eyes, open your, your will up to God. Behold, what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us, that we should be called children of God. The world does not know us because it did not know him. Beloved, now we are the children of God. It has not yet been revealed what we shall be, but we know that when he is revealed, we shall be like him. For we shall see him face to face. And everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself just as he is pure. Father, tonight we want to thank you that you so loved the world. That you gave your very heart, that you came down personally in the form of a man in flesh. That you lived the sinless life required under the law that our hope could be in you and not in us. God, thank you for showing us what love really looked like. Thank you for your willingness and your love and your humility to be last on our list, that we could come to you with all of our stains, our anger, the mess that we've made. And to know even then, God, with blood-stained tears in your eyes, you run to us. God, your love is amazing. 
Your love is amazing, God. How you can take a heart that is so guarded and so afraid to feel and just, God, your love breaks through, God. It just breaks through. It just takes down every wall that we've spent so many years building. God, thank you that you break through. Thank you that you tear down the walls. You do the impossible, God. Father, I pray for your creation, God, those that you've called by name, they're in this room right now, that you brought here. God, they think it was their family member that brought them here. God, you brought them here because their time has fully come. You've called them here, Lord, to walk them down the aisle, to call them by name, to wash away every sin and stain and the guilt and the anger and the bitterness and give them the joy of a salvation that you give freely. As the saints of God are in agreement with that prayer, that word, I want to speak to anyone in this room that you're hearing the gospel, some maybe for the first time, or maybe you've heard it so many times, but it's just never really clicked with you. But tonight, man, you're just going, I really want a relationship with God. I, I want that melted heart before God and where he can give me a love that no boyfriend, no girlfriend, no drug, no career, no bank account, nothing can give. I'm, I'm ready for God to give that to me tonight. And I'm willing to confess my sin and receive a debt-free account in the eyes of God. If you don't know you have that tonight, the Bible is so clear this big love letter from Genesis to Revelation, it says if you'll believe in your heart that Christ died for your sins, if you'll confess with your mouth that he was raised from the dead, Christ will live in you. Christ will live in you. Life will occur in you. You will be born again. In a moment, I'm going to give you the opportunity to take that step right where you're standing to make that eternal I do to a bridegroom that says, I want your hand, I want your heart, I want your yesterday, and I want you tomorrow. And if you're willing tonight to confess Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you want that assurance, I write right where you're standing to raise your hand high to heaven and say, I want to know that I know that I know that Jesus is my Savior tonight. I want to give everything over to him and know that I'm saved. Raise your hand high to heaven right now. Say, Jesus, that's me. God bless you and you and you. Amen. High towards heaven because I want you to know God's looking at your hand. It, it's not about the people in the room. Jesus says, if you confess me before man, I'll confess you before the Father. Right now, you raising your hand, you're saying, Jesus, I'm putting you first. You will be the lover of my soul. I'm devoting myself, God, to you, body, soul, and spirit. I confess to you, God, that I'm a sinner. I don't deserve such a love. But tonight, God, I receive your love. I receive a love that washes away all the pain, all the shame, all the guilt, all the anger. God, just flood me with a grace, God, with a mercy. God, put the ring on my finger. I just declare I do to you tonight, Jesus. I welcome you, Holy Spirit, that raised Christ from the dead. Fill me tonight. Fill me, God. Have your way. No matter what the cost is, Lord, I'm giving everything over to you tonight. In the name of Jesus. And if you prayed that prayer, say amen. Amen. Somebody shout to God. Yeah. Amen. 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 God is so good. Man, if that was you tonight, oh, I just want to so encourage you. When you go home, sit down with one of your family members. Start right then. Mary had to go to her, not only Joseph, but her dad and mom and say, Dad, Mom, something's happened. And it's going to seem really strange because you know me, but this, is, this really happened. And some people will be really happy for me. Some people will judge you. The happy ones for you will encourage your spirit. We're here for that in the house of God. The ones that judge you, they will test your declaration tonight to help you see how much root there is to your confession. And if it's real, I want you to know at Reveal Fellowship, as part of the body of Jesus, we're here to help you grow in the Lord. This isn't about you just making a confession. We're committed to help walk the walk with you. That's what the body of Christ is about. 
You're going to face some trials, difficulties. You need discipleship. You need to help in just walking with God. We're here. The body needs the body, right? And that's what real church is about. So if you raise your hand, if, you, if you're visiting and you're going back home, please find a good fellowship. If you need some help, call us. We'll, we'll help you. If you don't have a church, man, we welcome you to come here and grow. But make sure you have a place where you can go and get plugged in and rooted. Because it's a big part of not getting picked off by the enemy. Because you have an enemy. You raised your hand, you declared war against hell. Believe me. You think things were bad before, just wait. <laughs> and in the midst of that, there'll be so much joy, you'll be like, God, this is awesome. Oh, gosh. God is so good, isn't he? He's so good, so good. Hey, listen, it would not be Christmas Eve if we didn't sing Silent Night, right? I'm going to welcome you to take out your candles and begin to light those. And as you do, man, just consider that God looked at a world that was darkness. He said, let there be light. Jesus is called the light of the world. And tonight, if you raised your hand, the Bible calls you a child of light. Man, let's worship our King.